Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon for everyone, wherever you are joining us from. Thank you very much for watching my live streams. Uh, I really love seeing those uh, counters go up, and I really love your interactions and engagements with all of my uh, sessions. Today, we're going to talk about a very important topic, which is topics every software engineer must know. However, there's going to be a little bit of a surprise in how I approach this uh, the subject. And I know you already have expectations and you have thoughts about what I should be talking about, but I also have my own uh, you know, thoughts about this, uh, this topic. I would love to hear from you. So if there are anything uh, that you want to inquire about, questions you want to ask, wherever you're joining us from, uh, Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and I will do my best to answer them. And I will also take your comments and we can uh, also chat about them and debate them live. All right, so I'm going to approach this uh, conversation from, a, from the perspective of, um, in my opinion, tools and programming languages are, they, they expire very quickly. So any recommendation I'm going to make on programming languages or tools that you should learn today, in a year from now, you're most likely not going to be using them or you're going to be on a completely different trend. And I personally don't like to make videos that expire, uh, you know, or content that expires very quickly because what's the value of that? Uh, there are many people who share a lot of, you know, interesting insights on the latest trends, on the latest industry best practices, so on and so forth. I'm going to try to cover the second part, the industry best practices, maybe. Uh, but I'm not going to really talk about all of the latest trends and, and things like that. There might be other videos down the line where I cover these topics. What I want to do today is I want to share with you wisdom that lasts, right? I want to share with you experiences. Uh, topics that will last you a lifetime, probably last you your entire career, if if possible. Uh, I I know I'm making uh, grand statements. Uh, however, they these these this wisdom has lasted for my entire career so far. I still have a long journey in this field, but I, hopefully, but <laughs> but still, um, I think they they hold true uh, no matter how much time uh, passes on them. So um, I want to talk about things that also make a difference in your career. Right, things that you can implement tomorrow, uh, skills that you can acquire, that you can build, that you can implement, utilize directly, and see immediate and impactful results from. Right, and um, obviously this field is a blessing because it's a fountain of topics that you know they never expire, and and it's just the, the only limitation is how much you are curious as an individual and how much you you know you want to learn. Uh, if you really want to explore all of the boundaries and everything that this field has to offer, there's really no limit for how far you can go. So first, we're going to, the first part of this uh, live stream, I'm going to talk about what I think you must learn in terms of topics. And in the second part, I'm going to focus on the topics that a junior, senior, and the staff level plus developer should focus on and where they should be basically in relation to these topics, depending on their seniority and levels of experience in the field. I'm gonna help you define a little bit what it means to be a junior developer, what it means to be a senior developer, what it means to be staff plus, okay? So this is what we're gonna do today. And of course, if you have, again, any questions, any comments, whatever, please feel free to drop them and I will make sure that I have a look at the chat quite frequently like I'm doing right now. Uh, to see if there's anything that is worth, uh, you know, mentioning and covering. Awesome. So we're going to start by the first and most important thing that you should learn today, if you haven't done so already, which is learning how to learn. You might say, what, what, what is this? What, what do you mean by learning how to learn? What is this stupid thing? Uh, we've already done that uh, throughout all of our, you know, educational journey. What have we been doing? Well, you might have been learning, right? But you might not have discovered what is the best way for you to assimilate knowledge. And these are two different distinct things. In schools, they never teach this. They never teach you how you should study. They tell you you should study. <laughs> they tell you what you should study, when you should study, but they never tell you how to study, right? And it's very important for you to be able to acquire this skill as early as possible if you haven't done so one of my biggest struggles throughout you know 
high school, university, when things became tough and I could not rely on, you know, my intuition to make progress. I had to do hard work was my inability to figure out a way or an effective way to study. And um, that is that is very critical, uh, you know, topic that you need to acquire as early as possible. Identify the mechanisms that work for you. Uh, figure out ways uh, f f with which you can acquire and assimilate topics very rapidly and identify how you can extract signal, uh, you know, from just basic research and how you can advance yourself at a rapid pace. Learning how to learn, there are courses now about this, so I highly recommend that you go and explore this. Uh, it will help you tremendously throughout your entire career. If you manage to acquire information very rapidly, you will have a huge advantage over a big number of you know, uh, other peers or individuals in the field already. The second thing I want to mention is, in terms of you know, discovery, is you need to discover yourself. This might sound non-technical, and it is, because some of the best engineers I have worked with are the engineers who know themselves very well before them being technically capable. And this is the mistake that a lot of junior developers or people who are entering the field make. They assume that seniority comes from the fact that people acquire a lot of technical knowledge, a lot of hard skills. That's true in many cases. However, some of the, you know, most impactful engineers I know, some of the people who have led major projects and have been the most successful in the, in the field have had the ability to discover themselves and they were able to harness their internal powers in the sense that identify what triggers you, what makes you angry, what makes you, you know, thick, uh, what are the things that um, make you feel uncomfortable? Why is this important? Because in your interactions on a day-to-day -day basis with your team, with your peers at work, so on and so forth, having this internal knowledge is very important and it will make everything go much smoother. As you advance in your career, you will notice that technical problems are very easy and they're not really the issue here. Uh, th there is a tipping point after which, you know, there's very little, very less novelty, let's put it this way, very less discovery that you do in your field. Um, that you have to that you have to that you discover as you move forward and you will discover that most of the problems are human problems behavioral problems people problems you know so identify discover yourself first it will help you a lot with you know figuring out ways where you, with which you can deal with your colleagues uh, figure out what is the best way to convince you of something what is the best way to reason about something uh, what is the best way to you know uh, uh, understand um, uh, uh, different uh, different topics and different behaviors the third thing I want to mention, and again, these are just general rules that apply to different levels of seniority. It's what matters is that you actually start applying them or learning them and then, uh, you know, uh, and acquiring these skills. Sorry. The third topic is learning to be quiet. Uh, quite so often, um, quite so often I see a lot of people who just want to talk all the time. They never want to listen. And by talking all the time, there's not really much acquisition or acquiring that you do, right? In terms of learning knowledge, learning information, learning from people who know more than you do. And there will be people who know more than you do all the time. No matter how senior you become, there will always be people who know more than you do in different areas and different domains because they will have different interests, different focus, different specialities, so on and so forth. So learn to be quiet. Uh, learn uh, um, learn this skill as early as possible, especially if you have the tendency to talk a lot, like I do in these monologues. Uh, so learning to be quiet and listening in on others' talk and share their perspectives is very, very, very beneficial. Learn to be humble. This cannot be said enough. A lot of developers who enter the market, they think they know it all, especially after they graduate. And then they fall into the trap of thinking that because they have an engineering degree versus a computer science degree, that that degree really matters more. It doesn't. Um, none of this stuff that you've done in the university matters in the workflows. And sorry for all the universities and ed educational institutions, that's the truth. You will use a lot of that knowledge and information for sure, but it's not really going to make any difference. So the reason why companies focus a lot on degrees when they hire junior developers is because they don't have any other benchmark or any other criteria to judge you on. 
you know, uh, besides doing some tests or building tests on their own, there's really no, nothing other your, than your grades or your education or your university degree to judge you on. But later on in your career, no one is going to even bother to ask you about it. where you study, what did you study and whatnot. What matters are your skills, what you've done in the field, so on and so forth. So learn to be humble. Uh, this is a very important thing. Don't be uh, too proud. Uh, don't be too proud of your work. Don't be, don't promote your work all the freaking time. It's not always about you, 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 or me, me, me. Do amazing work that you are very proud of. But what's more important is let others speak of the work that you do, right? Let create this space so that others promote you, so that others brag about your work. This holds so much more value than you talking about, you know, whatever the, the greatest thing you've done or the greatest thing you've built. I mean, from every once in a while, it's nice to showcase what you've built, right? But bragging is different than showcasing. Showcasing is just telling people that you've built this, so on and so forth. Bragging is augmenting or making it bigger, uh, making yourself uh, bigger in the eyes of others. And that doesn't happen by you talking about it. I have three more things before we jump into the technical stuff. Uh, learn to assess anything from multiple perspectives. I cannot say this enough. Uh, a lot of people uh, start to you know, tackle a certain topic uh, and they have a very rigid perspective on it. They have a very rigid opinion. And we as developers, obviously, we have a lot of opinions to throw around. We're very opinionated. We have a lot of thoughts about pretty much anything and everything that comes our way. And we definitely want to make sure that we are heard and that we express these opinions uh, every chance that we get. However, a very important skill is having the ability to assess a certain topic from all the different perspectives equally with the equal weight, right? This gives you a superhuman ability to really be able to, you know, uh, harness different thoughts be empathetic, understand what the other counterparty is, is feeling, put yourself in their perspective, you will be able to really, uh, you know, do so much more than by holding your own opinion very strongly and pushing forward with it, right? Don't fall into the trap. That doesn't mean that you always have to cave in to other people's opinions or whatnot. No, that means that when you are really debating a certain topic in your mind, debate it from all different perspectives. It's like two chess players. It's like, sorry, the same person playing a game of chess with himself, right? Um, this is a very difficult skill to master, but when you do, it's very, very powerful uh, because then you can pretty much debate any topic in your mind from different angles. And I'm not saying that you don't need to talk to other people anymore, of course not, but I'm just saying that it gives you, a, it opens up so many doors for you. Uh, learn to be curious. I cannot say this enough. Uh, Curiosity is the essence and the, the fundamental core of everything. If you're not curious, you're not going to grow. Sorry, no matter what you do. It's like you cannot wait for people to feed you information or for information to stumble or to fall into your lab for you to start digging into it. You have to be curious about everything. I, for myself, am curious about literally everything. If I see something, I want to know how it works. I want to know the internals. I want to know when to use it, how to use it. I want to ask all of the different questions. I try to be a child when I explore new, con new topics. And, you know, I try to ask why 100 billion times. Why does this need to be this way? Why does this need to be that way? Why cannot, can we not do it that way? And don't fall into the rut of just, you know, taking things the way they are. Be curious, ask questions, challenge. Not in a challenge just to be, just to challenge. Challenge to learn more. Challenge to, towards an objective. Don't just challenge for the sake of challenging. I see a lot of uh, awesome comments in the chat. I will get back, I will get to you very quickly. Uh, just, I wanna get one more uh, thought across and I will start taking your, your comment and feedback and start, try to answer them. So uh, the last thing I wanna mention after learning to be curious is, Learn to pace yourself. Quite so often, I made the mistake myself. We get into this field and we start sprinting. We start rushing. We start running. We start, you know, wanting to do everything today. And we want to learn everything today. And we want to do whatever we can as soon as we can. Don't. Your career is a marathon. It is not a sprint. If you treat it as a sprint, you are setting yourself up for a huge burnout. If you don't know what a burnout is, Look it up. 
it's not something that uh, you want to do. Pace yourself, understand your limitations, take the time, breathe. It's okay to be ambitious. It's okay to want to do more. And I get obsessed about different topics when I'm really excited about them, for example. And I want to just produce more. I want to do more. I want to learn more. I want to absorb more. But you have to start recognizing your limitations. And when you do that, this is also part of your the discover yourself aspect. Understand when is your breaking, what is your breaking point. And again, once you start understanding your limitations, then you can maneuver and manipulate everything around you to fit your limitations. And this will allow you to transcend and take your abilities to the next level because then you can just shut down everything that takes energy from you and you can just keep and retain the things that allow you to evolve and get to the next level, right? So I see a, a comment from Rafiq. Uh, he says, what is system design? Well, we're going to talk about uh, software architecture and system design in a bit. But I, I just I want to give you a broad definition of system design versus what software architecture is. Um, software architect architecture might be looking at only the software piece of a certain you know uh, uh, product or maybe a service or a tool or whatever that it, that it is that we are building, uh, and we only look at it from a software perspective. We maybe look at it from a component perspective, from a module perspective, from a class perspective. You know, and this is this is where it hits the limit. Of course, we use these terms very loosely uh, in the field, and we don't really have very concrete definitions for a lot of things. But just take it with a grain of salt. So software architecture is focusing on you know, the, the software elements. System is much broader than the software. The system design is basically when you start looking at whatever you're building you know, as a system, and you start treating it as a, as a holistic thing as, as a big model that has certain inputs, it has certain outputs, it has certain behavior. And a system has certain behaviors. It behaves in a certain way and uh, it can uh, function appropriately or it can malfunction. And doing system design is understanding all of these things. So it's basically creating a model uh, as much as possible, of course, uh, you know, uh, of, of whatever you're building and try to understand it, not just from a software perspective. Because when we build software, we're not really building software in a vacuum. We're building software you know, that runs on machines. There are different levels that are abstracted from us. There's the hardware component. There's the network component. There's whatever is happening on a quantum level component, right? And when we write the code, we are completely disregarding all of these things. And we are treating them as things that should function according to our expectations. And when we give an instruction to a machine, we expect it to execute that instruction. However, uh, when we talk about system design, we are really trying to broaden our perspective and think about, you know, the, 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 the whole model that we are operating within that has way more valuables, way more constraints, way more variety than just, you know, the instructions that we provide to our code. And of course, that doesn't mean that we have to always start from the quantum mechanics level and go up all the way in abstractions. We just have to define what is... Uh, sort of what is a workable level of abstraction to start from. And you can define this with your team, with your project. There are different levels uh, you know, of, that, you can, that you can approach. So for example, if you're building a, a website, going down to the level of maybe the network or the infrastructure should be enough. However, if you're designing a, a for example, a PLC that should open some valves in a factory, and if they go wrong, you could blow up the factory. <laughs> then you need to start looking more at the uh, at a more fundamental level. You need to start looking at the hardware, the electronics. Maybe even go down to the you know physics level and understand the system at the much more granular level and a much more uh, uh, higher frequency. So this is system design in a nutshell. Uh, it's not just about software, right? It can really broaden and and cover so many different things. Uh, Joe. Uh, thanks for joining uh, the the live stream, Joe. I love uh, I love seeing you here. Uh, what will will you be talking about? Design patterns and good references, books to read. Yes, design patterns are. To be honest, let me give you my honest opinion about design patterns. Okay, so there are a ton of resources. Uh, one of my favorite ones is called. Um, wait, I forgot the website's name. I think it's called Refactoring. Uh, I think it's called refactoring. It's not the Martin Fowler book. 
uh, it's a website called refactoring.guru. And uh, yeah, let me put it let me put it here for you so that you can have it as reference. Uh, this is my favorite reference on design patterns, to be honest, just because uh, the way they approach it is is very nice. It comes with visuals, examples, code examples, and whatnot, and it makes the you know understanding the design pattern happen at a much 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 more concrete uh, level. What I want to say about design patterns is that they are a little bit a little bit overrated. Sorry for everyone who loves design patterns; they are. Um, you don't really implement design patterns on a daily basis and your knowledge of design patterns does not really determine your seniority. It's very nice to be aware of them. It's very important to, to learn about as, as design patterns, but you know, that sorry, they're just a little bit overrated. Um, it's fine to implement them. What you don't want to do is you just, you don't want to force design patterns on your implementations. More often than not, I see design patterns just, you know, glued onto a certain code base and that is super over-engineered uselessly, right? Uh, design patterns should be an evolution of the code. It should not be your starting point, especially if you don't know how or where your code is evolving. So again, design patterns are very nice to learn about. Uh, please go to that website I just dropped in the chat, learn more about them, be curious. It doesn't it doesn't uh, you know hurt to do some uh, to play around with them and to do some implementations of them. It will broaden your perspective and maybe you will even invent your own patterns. Uh, you know when you start uh, dealing with much more intricate and complicated uh, uh, software architectures. Uh, so thank you very much, Joe. That's a great question, and I'm very happy that you raised it because it's it's about time that we highlight uh, I highlight this this topic. All right. Another thing from uh, Rafiq, you say in the, at the end of the day, every web app developer must learn some JavaScript. Uh, yeah, well, JavaScript in the title of this of this live stream was a bit of a joke. I mean, I, I write JavaScript on a daily basis. That's fine. I love JavaScript. It's really cool. There are a lot of uh, weird, uh, quirky things about it as a language. It might not be extremely reliable uh, for uh, doing uh, so many different, um, you know, let's put it this way, they did some of the advanced, super advanced things. Uh, and I'm, a lot of people consider it a toy language. I don't. I think it's a great language, and I love it. I have I, I love a lot of aspects about it, even though sometimes it's, it drives me a bit nuts, you know, trying to discover what, or decipher uh, the certain implementations. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't really consider JavaScript as a critical topic that every software developer must know. I mean, sorry, but for any programming language, I don't think any programming language is a critical topic that every software developer must know. Sorry, what I'm trying to say is, is if you know 10 languages or one, in my opinion, you could be a very senior developer without knowing 10 languages. You could be a very senior developer by knowing just one and you know knowing that one language really, really well. So languages are just tools. As I tell my students always, they are tools to solve problems. We should never look at languages as you know their own thing. You should always look at languages in the context of a solution. Um, of course, you're always uh, free to go and uh, geek out and play around with languages if that's something you want. Uh, language design is obviously a major field. And if you're interested in that, you want to play around with languages just for the sake of learning, exploring, and being curious about them, by all means, please do that. I'm just trying to say in a professional setting, when you start trading your time and your skills as a developer for money, this these topics stop being relevant okay unless you work at a company that its own purpose and the business of the company is to build and design languages right so again knowing one language uh, very well is way more important than knowing a, a, a bunch of others uh Hassan is saying thank you Hassan, for joining the live stream uh, and thank you for your continuous support. Uh, you are saying, loving the content. I love the fact that you're here and thank you for uh, being, you know, a, uh, keeping an eye on, on, the, on the channel. You talked about developers who are eager to keep talking all the time. What are the best ways to deal with a peer like this effectively in the same team? Uh, wow, that's a, that's a tricky question because um, people who are like that generally uh, have certain there are certain gaps, let's let's put it this way, in, that they are trying to fill, right? Maybe when they were younger, they were not really listened to. And I'm not going to try to analyze people and overgeneralize. That's really not what I'm trying to do. I'm just 
giving an example from what I've seen in my experience. Uh, maybe they, they just want to talk because they, they did not really get enough attention or they're not really getting enough attention. Or maybe they just, uh, you know, feel like they have a lot to share and offer and that they, they are entitled to other pe people's time and opinions. To be honest, the way I would deal with it is I would just have a very honest, transparent conversation. And I would not approach it from the perspective of me trying to teach that person something. I would approach it from a perspective of, hey, listen, for example, I'm going to take an example. Hey, listen, Hussein, I, I, uh, do you mind if we talk for a little bit? Um, I have noticed that throughout different sessions, you have a tendency, you know, to, uh, to talk uh, a, a little bit more than everyone else. Uh, and I don't mean to say this in any negative way. I just wanted to bring this to your attention. Uh, you might want to consider, you know, creating a little bit more space for others to express themselves. It's always interesting to hear what others have to say. Uh, this doesn't mean that, you know, you don't have to voice your opinions and whatnot, but uh, you might just want to be aware of this and, you know, try to control it a little bit. Um, that could be a way you could approach this. I'm not saying this exact verbiage. Now I'm just improvising, <laughs> right? There might be better ways for you to, to handle this uh, situation. But I'm just saying, just be honest, talk to people, right? I mean, I don't think you should be confrontational. And it all depends on how you, what terms you use and how, what's the tone of your voice when you approach the, this conversation. And I think people should be, it, it's nice to make people aware of certain things. I have been called out uh, a lot of times in my career where people said to me, hey, listen, you need to pay attention to this. Uh, I might not be aware of it. I might be talking and I'm not really thinking about what others are feeling or thinking about what I'm doing. And it would be nice for people to bring it to my attention so that I'm aware of it and I can, you know, if there's something to fix, then I would love to, to do so. Um, all right, life pro tip. If you think you deserve praise and you're not getting it, give some uh, of the other team members uh, the praise so that they know how important and pleasant it is. 1,000 billion percent true. Yes, that is correct. Absolutely. Uh, it's magical how it works, to be honest. And uh, it's wonderful when it works. Uh, and it's amazing when you join a company that has that culture. The culture where people give and praise the good work of others. And not just praise for the sake of praise. Even sometimes if it is it's shadow, shallow praise, it still creates a very positive environment. Uh, you know, even if the merit, if you feel that that other person, uh, you know, doesn't really matter or didn't do a really much of a great thing. It's okay. Praise people. If you praise them, you will unlock some really wonderful things in their behavior. It's a very positive thing to do. And yes, I agree 100% with you, Hussein. It's very important to, uh, you know, share praise. You will receive it way more often and you will get it uh, in ways that you cannot, uh, you know, uh, sorry, that you cannot anticipate. Um, all right, we have something from Code Concept. What is this webinar about? <laughs> is it about JavaScript? No, it's not about JavaScript. It's about topics every software engineer must know. And I um, started the, the, the you know an introduction about how I want to approach this 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 subject. And uh, if you scroll a little bit back to the beginning, <laughs> you'll be able to figure out uh, what we're talking about here. So Muhammad, uh, thank you for joining Muhammad. Uh, you are asking, when should a junior start having a concern regarding software design and architecture? Wonderful question. I'm going to talk about it right now as I enter the second segment of this uh, live stream. I want to take on a couple of more questions before we move forward. Uh, Will is saying, uh, what do you think about system uh, containing models uh, that is having configuration spread all over an architecture with several files and abstractions that are very hard to follow. Well, I think you are talking about a uh, very difficult to maintain uh, solution and we have all been part of projects that are like that. Um, technical debt is off the charts. Uh, everyone is not able to really maintain this uh, code base. Uh, many things are uh, going um, in so many different directions. Uh, the, the very difficult, you know, to, to just move forward with this code base. I have talked in a previous session about the importance of not doing, you know, major refactoring. Uh, uh, sorry, my apologies, not rewriting the app. It's important to do refactoring all the time. And what refactoring means is, Every time you try to introduce new work, 
it's your responsibility as a developer to try and take on another chunk and make it a little bit better. Take on another module, take on another thing. And don't ever think about a rewrite. It never pays off. It's never good. It's just wasted time and it never does the return on investment. Unfortunately, uh, bad code and bad systems are something that we have to learn to live with and that we have to start cleaning up. It's called debt for a reason. If you accumulate debt, you never wake up in the morning with a $1 million check under your pillow that you can go to the bank and pay up your debt if you have debt with that at that level, right? So same thing with gold. You have to put in energy to fix it. And there are no magical solutions for this, unfortunately. You just have to clean it up, figure it out bit by bit, uh, and, and approach it from that, from that perspective. I apologize from everyone coming from LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a really horrible problem with comments that I cannot see them live. Uh, I see a lot of people saying, hi, Ahmadu, hello, Armin. I'm very glad to see you here, Armin. Uh, it's been a while and I hope you're doing great. Uh, hello, Hisham. Uh, Hisham has a couple of questions. What is the difference between JavaScript and TypeScript? Well, I mean, yeah, we could talk about this, but let me cover the rest of the you know content of this episode. And if you have some time towards the end of this session, I will I will tell you what is the difference between JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, Muhammad uh, Kiblawi is saying, as a senior developer, what advice do you give people who are new to programming or people who are below your level? That is fantastic. I'm going to cover this right now when I talk about you know the topics that people should learn about uh, in different levels of seniority. Last thing from Joe. Uh, he is saying, what to do when you feel you're not that technically challenged at your everyday job? Two things, my friend. You talk to your manager and you ask for more challenge. If you don't have more challenge and it's not possible to give you more challenging tasks at your job, you quit. <laughs> That's what you do and you move on to the next, uh, next step. Uh, in our field, I think everybody knows, and it's probably a rule right now in the domain that uh, software engineers don't last in a certain uh, company for more than a couple of years. Uh, I think if you last, if you spend more than that time, then there, there is the law of diminishing returns starts to kick in. Uh, because the market is so hot, you're probably getting paid less. Uh, and maybe you are missing out on some learning that you need to do. Uh, of course, there is a lot of value in places without where the systems and solutions and software is evolving and it's growing. And it's one thing to work on a small project, and it's another thing to work on a growing project, right? That's an experience that you have to get all by itself. However, there are a lot of jobs where you just keep on doing the same thing every day, and the software is not really evolving or growing, and there's not really much challenge there. So I'm sorry. You just got to quit. Find something else that is more challenging, Joe. All right, awesome. So let's uh, jump to the next uh, segment of this uh, live stream. And in this segment, we're going to be talking about the topics every junior, senior, and staff plus engineer must know. All right, so let's start with the junior developers. First things first. Every junior developer starts worrying about what technology stack do I need to learn? What is the thing that's going to offer me jobs? What is the best you know, uh, uh, tech stack that is going to open all the doors in the world for me? There isn't one, right? Whatever technology stack you pick to start with is a good technology stack. At this stage, it doesn't matter what you start with. For the love of God, if you, even if you start with COBOL or Fortran or something really, really old, it doesn't matter. You, you really are starting so fresh that anything at this point is an added value to your benefit. It doesn't matter whether you start with the trendiest thing or you start with something a little bit older. It's fine. The fundamentals are all the same across all technology stack. Keep this in your mind all the time. Uh, pick one. What matters is that you pick one and you stop jumping from one thing to another and uh, focus on that technology stack until you develop a good understanding of it. And from there, if you so choose to start meandering or going towards other technology stacks and you, you are obviously curious about different things and different trends, by all means, feel free to do so. Uh, feel free to do so. 
and uh, you will only uh, grow from there. So lesson number one, don't be picky about a tech stack, just choose one and move forward with it. Second thing for a junior developer, be curious and absorb information like a sponge. I talked about this at the beginning of the episode, but I, it's very important that I'm going to re-emphasize it here as well. Be curious about everything and try to assimilate and accumulate as much information as you can. Learn from others, learn by observing, sit down with more senior people, talk, to, listen to more senior people. Don't talk, listen to more senior people, learn from them. If you don't have more senior people around you, join live streams like this one and learn from, you know, what people have to share, learn from the engagements, learn from the comments, join a community, for example, join, uh, um, you know, there are a lot of discord groups, discord service. There are a lot of Slack groups where a lot of different, you know, senior, junior, whatever engineers, they intermingle, they talk about different topics, they share their experiences they share their learnings and trust me this will accelerate your journey way more than you being isolated and spending time reading blogs or watching just youtube videos right so try to become uh try to be curious absorb information learn from your seniors and try to participate in communities learn source code management best practices it doesn't have to be git before git there were a gazillion other source code management solution Solutions starting from ClearCase, Perforce, uh, Subversion, uh, uh, CSV, uh, CVS, and a bunch of many, many, many others. They all have different mechanisms and different ways of working, and they facilitate certain types of workflows. Um, what matters is that you build up mastery in one. Today, Git is the most prominent and it is the most popular. So I highly recommend Git and eventually I work at GitHub. So <laughs> it's obvious that I will be recommending this. Uh, but still, I have a very fond, uh, you know, affinity or I really like Git as a, as a, as a, as a source code management solution. Um, but also keep an open mind. There are other, other things that your companies might be using. Your companies might even have built their own version. If you're working at places like Google or otherwise, they might even have built their own, you know, spin-off from, from Git or Perforce and, and systems and, and, and the likes. So Git is not as universal as you might think. Uh, I deal with this on a daily basis. It's not. It's very popular and it's very important for you to learn it. And if you learn it, it will facilitate learning other source code management solutions as well. Do not specialize. This is the fourth thing. I see a lot of developers saying, I am a mobile developer. I am a Android developer. I am an iOS developer. I don't want to do anything other than play with my phone all day. Sorry, you're wrong. Please don't specialize early in your career you will have a very difficult time when you become a senior developer in a certain area where uh, you know uh, you are uh, specialized in a very specific narrow niche, specifically when it comes to vendor locking. Like imagine you're locking yourself to a specific vendor. Like imagine tomorrow the iPhone doesn't, is not any, is not the, 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 the most um, you know, used, well, iPhone is not the most used phone, but let's say it's not as popular as it is today. Maybe Android is not as popular as it is today. Something much more awesome came out and people just started adopting it. What will you do then if you don't know anything and you have specialized for so long in such a platform? Uh, and again, this is not a, you know, an attack towards mobile developers. By all means, you folks are doing an amazing thing in your domain and area, and I highly recommend specialization, but in later stages of your career. As a junior developer, you have to be exposed to pretty much everything regarding the web, mobile, anything you can get into, right? Don't specialize too early. Number five, and then I will start taking on more comments and more uh, questions. Number five, build as if your life depends on it. Imagine your career, think of your career as if it's a game, and the only way to lose the game is by if, is if you stop building. And that is the fundamental truth of software engineering or software development in general. If you stop building, you die, period. That's it. That's the end of it. You have to continuously be building things. You have to build maybe on the job, maybe outside of the job. You might be building in your own free time. You might be building uh, you know, a product, a side project. You might be building something for fun. You might be building something to learn more about a certain you know, niche area or a concrete topic. What matters is that you keep building. It's very important. This is the only way you're going to grow. It's fine to read stuff, 
but the concrete knowledge of our field is only gained by building, right? This is a fundamental uh, truth that you always have to keep in mind. All right, I see a question from Ahmad uh, who is saying, uh, tell us about current JavaScript, uh, Java Spring framework status, and uh, is it used in very large enterprise companies? <laughs> yeah, um, I like the question. I, I have seen Java very, very, Java Spring specifically, um, uh, in a lot of um, companies across Europe, a lot. I see it a lot. Uh, and it's very, very popular. And um, there are a lot of jobs that still require Java and Java Spring specifically. I like the fact that they have modernized the framework and they, they have borrowed a lot of different concepts from, you know, uh, my, uh, let's put it this way, from different popular, more popular <laughs> frameworks. Uh, however, I don't see it as often in the US, for example. Of course, I don't have statistics to back this up, but from my engagements, I don't say Java Spring, for example, a lot. Um, and specifically in Silicon, Silicon Valley, where innovation happens at a much faster pace. Uh, I'm not saying that you should drop it or you should adopt it or whatever. Uh, it, it really depends, as I mentioned, Java, uh, sorry, languages and frameworks are just tools to solve problems. Java has many great advantages uh, and it can play really well in so many different environments. I see it a lot in financial systems. I see it a lot in fintech. I see it a lot in you know uh, banking and whatnot and also in many major enterprises. But I also see a lot of, uh, you know, I see a lot of Go, I see a lot of Python, I see a lot of uh, Ruby, I see a lot of so many different things. It's quite versatile. Uh, so don't fixate on one thing. If you have experience in Java Spring, great. Learn something new now. Try to explore a different framework, try to explore a different language, try to explore a different paradigm. It's always good to, to you know, do these things. Um, any, I see Farouk asking, any alternative to watch other than LinkedIn? Uh, yes, definitely. And I'm not sure what's happening to, uh, to LinkedIn, to be honest, uh, because it's not showing all the comments. Uh, however, this is the link that you can, where you can watch my live stream on YouTube. I also have Facebook. Uh, I prefer YouTube, to be honest, and you can help me uh, by subscribing and liking these videos so that I can keep on growing my channel. Uh, this is my primary, you know, where I put not just live streams, but I put a lot of other material uh, materials and a lot of other videos that I think would be very beneficial for you. And I'm I'm working on a few solid videos that I'm going to be publishing really soon regarding um, code spaces, Visual Studio Code, and working in dev containers, and uh, you know, finishing my GitHub Actions uh, full course. Uh, if you haven't seen that one, it's a really great DevOps course using GitHub Actions. So I just dropped the link to my. Uh, YouTube channel over here, uh, glitch.stream slash live. A slash live will take you always to the latest video that I have published, but you can always go to just glitch.stream glitch and it will take you to my YouTube channel um, uh, straight away. Thank you very much for asking, uh, Farouk. Kevin, I am very happy to see you uh, here and thank you very much for your support and endorsement across all of this time. Uh, I love seeing your name, Kevin, and I hope you have a really great day today. Uh, Kevin is a colleague of mine. We work together at GitHub. He's awesome. Uh, follow him. Uh, all right, cool. So number six, when it comes to junior developers, uh, forget the trends, right? This is important. A lot of junior developers, they start with a certain track. And this also follows a little bit from being picky about the technology stack. I see uh, developers start in one area and then immediately they, they get confused and they start learning something new. And probably every couple of days, they're learning something different without really developing strong, a, a strong understanding of a certain of the fundamentals. They just are jumping uh, left, right and center. They don't know what to follow. They think by not following the trends that they are missing out. You have to understand that Trends have a, a, a and and technology in general. It's not it, it develops fast. Yes, that's true, right? But it's not as fast as you might think because when a company does an investment in a certain technology stack, they're not going to change it next week for the next trend. If they if a company builds a product in a certain programming language and a framework, they're not going to change it tomorrow. They're not going to rewrite their whole thing just because another language popped up, right? 
I mean, GitHub, for example, since the inception, it has been written with Ruby. And until today, we haven't changed that. However, we started to diversify in certain areas because there are languages that perform better in different uh, places. And we need to start adopting those. We use a lot of Go, for example, for building a lot of the new services. And a lot of companies do the same. They just identify which is the best tool for the job and they start diversifying in that area. But that doesn't mean that you as an individual, you need to start to, you need to learn and hop on every trend. It's okay to hop on trends and to be uh, curious about them, of course, maybe in your free time, but it's not a necessity to just be a master of every new trend, right? It's important to focus. It's important to develop expertise in a certain specific area, and then you can, uh, you know, start uh, jumping on trends and learning a little bit more about them. But as a junior developer, forget trends. There will be time where you can, you know, acquire information much at much faster rate. Remember, Learning how to learn is one of the fundamentals that I started with. And if you learn how to learn very quickly, then you can learn and get what you need from the latest trends at a much faster pace. And you will be much more effective uh, at this, when you become a senior developer on hopping on trends. Learn to navigate the internet. This comes without saying, but come on. Like, I mean, there are so many people that spend so much time on Stack Overflow, but there's so much more than Stack Overflow where you can find information. Learn how to navigate the docs of your framework and of your programming language. For the love of God, the docs, doc, the docs are the most amazing place where you can just, it keeps on giving, you know? Like it's one thing to find a formula for how to do things uh, on Stack Overflow. It's another where you learn how to navigate the docs of something that you use on a day-to-day -day basis and where you can go really deep and identify from the source how to do something. So learn to navigate the internet. There are plenty of amazing resources. I am going to drop a couple of links over here for you to be uh, aware of them. And these links are for junior developers specifically. So there is this awesome website. It's called roadmap.sh. And uh, uh, a fellow um, developer, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Um, maybe Cameron, if I'm not mistaken. I apologize if I butchered the name completely. But anyway, just go check roadmap.sh. He has built these very, very nice visualizations for you know, what it means to be a back-end developer, front-end developer, DevOps engineer, so on and so forth. And they show you the different, uh, you know, topics that you need to learn, the, the hard skills, the, 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 you know, the technologies that you need to, to be aware of uh, for you to develop mastery in a certain, in a certain domain or a certain area. Uh, this is what I'm not doing specifically today because there are a lot of awesome resources like this where you can go and fetch and get and collect that information. Um, all right, I'm going to keep it on the screen for a little bit uh, just so that you can take note of it. And the last thing I want to say for junior developers is, for the love of God, do not waste time on certification. <laughs> I see people saying now that they are X number certified in whatever. It means absolutely nothing. I hire. I've been involved in hiring all the time. Uh, I've hired before GitHub. I've hired you know, recruited hundreds of engineers. Certifications mean absolutely nothing. It's nice, you know, to, to don't, don't get me wrong. The learning journey for you to get the certificate is very important. You're learning something very important and it's, it's, you know, you're learning something that is critical. You're developing your skills. And by all means, I applaud you for doing this. And I applaud your dedication for, you know, continuing your education and learning in a structured way. And I applaud your discipline for going through an entire course and getting the certificate. But in the job market, the certificate means very little. There are so many people who have certificates. And when it comes to work, they don't really provide a uh, guarantee that you know your stuff. I'm sorry, but they don't. Uh, if you have a cert if you have ten certificates, but you cannot articulate uh, what you know, uh, and and you cannot really uh, clarify the the content and make it easier for others to understand uh, the the concepts, what what does what what good does 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 your certificate serve in this case, right? So again, uh, studying for the sake of studying and building up yourself and acquiring more knowledge and growing by all means. Please do it, do it all the time. Don't just accumulate certificates for the sake of using them as badges of accomplishment. They hold very little meaning in the job market. Um, all right, 
Now, I think we're going to overshoot the one hour for this session, and that's totally fine, I think, because we're going to talk about still a couple of levels, senior and staff engineer plus. And let's start with senior developers and what the topics I think they should, or every senior developer should know. Uh, number one is learn mentoring. Every senior developer, when we tell them, uh, when they, you know, they, they become senior, technically, uh, they don't have any skills in mentoring others. And then they become overloaded and they start complaining about being overloaded and they have a lot of work to do and they're very busy. So the manager comes in and says, okay, great. We're going to hire a few junior developers to help you out. And the first reaction of senior developers is no, 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 no. I don't want to, I don't want to. Uh, hire junior developers, I cannot spend any time in teaching them. <laughs> you know, great. That's your, that's, that's a failure on your behalf as a senior developer. I'm sorry, but as you grow more in this field, you're not going to be writing more and more code. You're going to be writing less and less code. And the more you grow into this field, you're going to have to start delivering through others. The earlier you understand this, the earlier you put this in your mind, you accept this reality, the much better you will have a career path. Even for the jobs where and the companies that promise a technical track parallel to the managerial track, learning how to mentor others, how to mentor junior developers specifically and peers maybe even, and learning how to deliver through others, um, it's... Um, it's, it's a very important critical skill that you need to acquire as early as possible and it will make you successful and it will allow your company and yourself and your team to scale uh, beyond uh, your individual capabilities. And uh, in many organizations, you will not be able to grow and get promoted if you don't learn how to manage other people. So uh, learn how to mentor, learn how to be a good mentor, learn how to teach without you being forceful uh, teach the way you would like to be taught. Uh, try to understand what is the learning mechanisms of the other developers, right? Again, it's about the, the self-discovery. Teach the junior developers how to do self-discovery, just like I'm trying to do right now, right? Uh, ask them how they would like to learn. And based on that, try to cater your mentoring to their learning abilities and their learning methodologies. Now, the next thing that I see senior developers fail at, and it's not technical as well, is managing upwards. Everyone in this field, when they start off their career, they are maybe mid-level, early senior. They think that managers manage them. So the managers, your manager manages you. That's not true. You need to learn to manage upwards. You need to learn to manage your manager. That's a very important skill. And when I first heard about it in my career, I was like, what? Well, then what is the purpose of the manager in that case, if, if I have to manage them? Well, when I say manager, manager, I'm not saying that you go tell your manager what they need to do. I'm saying you need to be able to learn how to communicate useful information to your managers so that they can take action on it. If you flood your managers with information that is absolutely not necessary, they're going to dismiss your feedback because you're creating noise for them uh, that is that they cannot take action on. So managing upwards means understand what your manager can and cannot do, and then cater your feedback and input based on what they actually can do. And don't just raise up complaints, provide them also with what you think are solutions for the problems. Don't forget that even technical managers, they will have problems managing people because they are not in the trenches. They are not in the ditch shoveling the crap every day like you and myself are. We are the ones dealing with the code base. We are the ones who are building. We are the ones who understand at a very critical level uh, you know, how everything works. Your managers, even if they are technical, they're not involved in the code base anymore. And the code base is not static. It's always evolving. So even if they have an idea of the, a snapshot of the code base at a certain point in time, they don't know how it evolved. You do. So it's very important for you to always manage upwards in the sense that provide the useful information for your managers so that they can take action on 
preemptively communicate failures and problems so that they can help you solve them before they become much bigger than they need to be. All right. Uh, let's see. Software. Sorry. Third one. Focusing on business outcomes. I see a lot of developers, uh, senior developers also, and maybe even staff developers in certain organizations uh, uh, focusing on just technical stuff, focusing on always complaining about the software architecture, the cleanliness of the code. We need CICD, we need DevOps, we need blah, blah, blah. We need to do this, we need to do that. We need the, to move to the cloud. We need to get out of the on-prem uh, setup that we have. We need to buy 100 servers. We need to do whatever. But then when, the, when we start scratching the surface and try to understand really why are we doing this? Why do we need this? We discover that a lot of developers try to evolve themselves at the expense of the company's resources. And what I mean by this is a lot of the technical decisions that are sometimes made, and I'm not going to say a lot, I'm just going to say some technical decisions that are made by certain individuals sometimes are, in for, are fueled by their own desire to learn a certain concept or topic or technology and then they try to push it towards their organization and it doesn't make any sense from a business perspective. And what I mean by that is if what you're trying to push does not bring in more revenue, if it does not make uh, the product sell more, if it does not make the user experience better, if it does not uh, you know, help uh, you onboard maybe juniors at a much faster pace, if there is no business justification for the change that you want to apply, and it's not just, you know, just for to have a business justification that we come up with something from thin air. No, try to have a concrete business justification. Try to quantify it. And if you don't learn this skill early on, then no one's going to take you seriously because you're going to be the one who complains as opposed to the one who provides solutions. So be solution-oriented, focus on business outcomes, and trust me, you will be way more successful in your career than by just focusing on, you know, uh, raising complaints about how uh, how much technical debt you have without explaining uh, what is the business outcome of clearing and eliminating that technical debt, even if it feels trivial and it should be, you know, understood by managers. But again, what governs everything is how is the business performing? That is the that is the clock that everyone works uh, upon. Next, for senior developers, software architecture, very fundamental. You have to understand how to design systems. You have to be good in diagramming. You have to be good in uh, drawing abstract models of, your soft, of the software or the pieces of code or whatever you are building. It's very important to understand system design and what it means to have different variables come into play and of course, you're not going to never be able to create a 100% accurate model, but it's very important to have the skills uh, to be able to get out of the code base and think at a much higher level of abstraction and then communicate that level, that abstraction, you know, to your development teams so that they can actually focus on the implementation. And as a senior developer, you need to still uh, focus on how things are implemented, but when it comes to enabling your junior developers to implement, you don't need to dictate every single thing that they do. You need to provide them with a set of constraints. You need to provide them with what they need to build. And then you need to let them go and they have to figure out how to build it. And then you can come and provide feedback and the cycle repeats. And this is how you can allow them to grow. Don't forget that the way you grew yourself is by making a lot of mistakes and by trying things on your own Sorry, and by getting feedback from your seniors and by, you know, spending time building, right? So again, software architecture, very critical, very important. Network architecture is another topic that is also very fundamental. You have to understand what is happening on the protocol level. I'm not saying that you should be able, you know, to uh, sniff every single packet and understand and recite the TCP protocol by heart. And uh, you need to recite uh, all of the standards and RFCs of the HTTP protocol. <laughs> but you should be aware of them, right? You should be aware of, like, if I ask, if you are a web developer, for example, and you are a senior developer, senior engineer, or you call yourself a senior engineer, if I tell you, this is a, this was an interview question for Amazon for a while, by the way. 
uh, if I tell you, uh, you open your browser and you type in a URL in the address bar. Explain to me everything that happens and go as deep as you can, you know, in explaining all of the steps that happen when, as soon as you press the enter button in your browser until the page is rendered. This is a good way for you to measure your skills and measure what you know. And you can go so deep into this. You can go to so many different levels of depth, uh, you know, in this journey from just punching in the, you know, the, the URL and then hitting enter. You can talk about how the browser processes that input. And then what happens at the first point when it comes to DNS resolution. And then you can talk about networking. You can talk about routing. You can talk about what happens until that request hits the server. You can talk about the HTTP protocol and what happens when you make that request. How does the server parse this? How does it generate the response? Where does it get the files from? Where does it get the information? How does it render the page? You can talk about server-side rendering. You can talk about sessions, cookies, uh, you know, authentication. You can talk about so many stuff that can happen on the back end. And then when you're done with rendering the, 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 the response, you can talk about the route back. And then you can talk about how the browser renders the page and what happens on, a, on, on the HTML, CSS, parser, slash, uh, you know, rendering level, so on and so forth. So you can go really, really wild with this. And this is a good question with which you can measure, you know, how, how much depth you have in these fields. Uh, so again, fundamentals, right? It's, nothing is really groundbreaking over here. DevOps culture and DevOps best practices. This is number six. And for the love of God, DevOps is not CICD only. So if you are not familiar with the fundamentals of DevOps, I have made a few videos about them. So there is one video, uh, and I'm going to um, add a card for, for this uh, when I'm done. One video with the director of uh, communities of practice, Jared Morrell at GitHub where we talk for 30 minutes about what DevOps is and we define it and we talk about all the facets of what, uh, what, what constitutes the term DevOps, where did it originate from? And then I have the GitHub Actions course where at the beginning of each segment uh, of me talking about uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment, I cover the history of how things were done before and what is the modern way of doing things, right? And um, and then this, this will help you understand a little bit more the, the, what, what the term DevOps means and how we can uh, apply DevOps in our day-to-day uh, -day life. But at the most fundamental level, DevOps means that the people who build something are the ones who are responsible for the operations of that something. And they are the ones who are responsible for making sure that that thing works in production or wherever, uh, wherever you deploy it. Moving forward, Number seven, for senior developers, you need to know cloud. Especially if you are a web developer, you need to understand cloud architecture. You need to understand what is happening at the infrastructure level. And it starts by understanding, again, the basics of um, uh, data centers and what, what goes on in there. You don't have to understand all the integrity details, but it's good to have a, a picture in your mind about you know, how are our solutions hosted. And, and what constitutes uh, these solutions. Um, cloud architecture is fundamental. There are many courses online right now. And one tip for everyone who is trying to study anything about uh, the cloud, all of the cloud providers, they offer the same exact thing. So fundamentally, <laughs> it's all the same. Uh, there are certain variations in how they name the services and how their services work. But fundamentally, it's all the same. So. Uh, keep that in mind when you study the cloud, focus on one cloud provider, study that cloud provider very well, and then from there you can jump to other uh, providers and learn more as you go. Awesome. Finally, I want to mention for senior developers, it's very important for all of them to be aware and understand the fundamentals of testing. And testing, I mean end-to-end -end testing. That means unit testing, integration testing, uh, even manual testing, and uh, probably UI testing, you have to be quite well versed in all of these things. And I do not accept that testing is the job of the QA engineers. That is very old school. There is no such thing as it's the job of someone else. Testing is first and foremost the job of the developers themselves. And if you don't understand the fundamentals of testing and you're not able to build proper, adequate unit tests 
and integration tests. I'm sorry, but you failed your job as a developer. I'm not sure I would put you in the category of senior developers. So testing is very critical. It's very important. It's very fundamental. Please spend time in acquiring this uh, skill and knowledge. And uh, trust me, it will only make you a better developer and it will only give you success. Now, I want to spend the last five minutes of the session talking about what it means to be a staff developer. And in many uh, organizations, especially in big tech, uh, you will see the term staff engineer used a lot, staff software engineer. And what staff software engineer means is tech lead. Uh, they are basically the, the technical lead. And then there's one level higher, which is principal, maybe two levels higher. So there's uh, staff and then principal and then distinguished, distinguished engineer. Um, so staff is basically tech lead. Principal is at the level of director, and then distinguished is, is much higher, probably at, at, the, at the VP level. But this is very, very rare, and it's very limited to people who, for example, have major contributions in a certain domain or in a certain area. Like, for example, um, um, I'm not sure if he holds the title, but maybe the, the, the author of Python, the language, um, probably he holds that title in, in in whatever he works i think he's at google now if i'm not mistaken right or um guido guido is working uh let me check very quickly so uh guido is working guido van grossen um he was at dropbox i think he is at in google at google now right uh, oh, no, he's in uh, Microsoft. <laughs> All right, awesome. So <laughs> Guido is now a colleague. Well, I mean, uh, not, not necessarily we don't interact, but uh, yeah, well, we both work for Microsoft now. So um, again, people like that probably hold the title of distinguished engineers and, and their main uh, Sorry, my bad. I have... Um... I have clicked on the refresh button by mistake. Uh, apologies for this. So uh, Guido, for example, is, is one of the people who would hold the title of distinguished engineer. Again, let's talk about staff plus. So uh, staff engineers, uh, for example, what will they be focusing on? Uh, they will be focusing on um, strategy versus tactics. So as a senior developer, all your focus is probably going to be how can we solve this problem? How can we uh, you know, get by to the next day? How can we uh, move forward? How can we design certain thing, a certain uh, a piece of uh, technology or a certain piece of the product or a certain service? Um, staff engineers, they need to focus on the strategy. Where are we going with the product? Where are we going with the service? Uh, how do we design something across multiple teams? How do we design things across multiple services? Everyone, in my opinion, should contribute to the architecture. It's not necessarily limited to staff engineers plus. That's not that's not how big tech works, and that's not how effective organizations work. Everyone should be part of uh, the architecture process. However, staff engineers, they need to hold in their mind, they need to be accountable for a lot of this, right? They need to be the ones who drive the large projects that affect multiple teams. They need to be the ones who drive the really gigantic um, high impact uh, projects. Okay, so this is the the first responsibility. They need to focus on strategy, and they need to stop focusing on tactics. Uh, managing upward all the way to the executive level, and by executive level I mean CTO, CTO, and CEO level. And it depends how big your organization is, but uh, also see executives and leadership teams they require insights sometimes from the field, right? And staff plus engineers should be or should have the capacity to communicate this information in a digestible manner because the leadership team does not is not necessarily technical or they might not be, uh, you know, dealing with every day to day stuff in, uh, on, in in the field. Staff engineers have the responsibility to communicate this information in 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 as simple uh, uh, in simple terms as possible and make sure that the leadership teams understand the trade-offs of the decisions that they have to make. Uh, this is the responsibility of staff engineers. 
and they have to be able to uh, provide the trade-offs, provide the pros and cons of every decision, why we need to go in a certain direction, why we need to go in that other direction. They need to be able to provide the business justification for different technical decisions so that they allow the leadership team to make the appropriate decisions and the informed decisions. Next is the staff engineers need to manage laterally. They need to manage on the same level as well. So they need to manage their peers. There are a lot of staff engineers on the same level that are concerned with other aspects of the product or service or whatever, right? Especially in large organizations, there will be many, many, many technical leads. So these technical leads need to be able to communicate with each other so that they can create and come up with solutions that touch upon multiple layers and multiple teams and multiple entities, right? And they need to coordinate. So they have to be able to manage at the same level as well. Uh, staff plus engineers, they need to be able to set the tone. They need to be the immediate leaders of the senior engineers and whatnot and their own teams. They need to be the ones who are, you know, uh, beating the drums of war uh, when it comes to the cadence of how we work and uh, the speed with which we design and build. Uh, they need to be the ones who provide the sort of the... the uh, the wisdom, they need to be the, the best mentors, they need to demonstrate leadership in all of its forms, and they need to manage by uh, by applying, you know, the, the, the principles and the values that they want their teams to uh, implement or apply themselves. So they need to lead by, uh, there's a term for it, they need to lead by uh, example. <laughs> That's the word. Um, so if the staff engineers are very loose, very chill, you know, they don't care, their teams will also not care. So uh, they have a very big responsibility in setting the cadence and the tone and, you know, how and how fast we move forward. Um, they need to learn how to deliver through others. So as I mentioned, the more you grow into this area and in this field, the more you need to start delivering through other people, the less you will need to do hands-on work yourself. Of course, you still need to do hands-on work. You still need to be involved with the code base, but you might not be writing code as much as you would be when you are a senior developer. I think if you want to write code and you want to spend the majority of your time writing code, you need to stay at the senior level. And, um, and as soon as you grow beyond that, you become a tech lead, you start spending more time in management, communication, uh, you know, designing, managing upwards, managing laterally, communicating as opposed to sitting down and, uh, you know, building stuff. You will always be building stuff, of course, but it's probably going to be like 10, 20, 30 percent of your time as opposed to, you know, 80 or even 90 percent of your time in building things. Um, they, staff engineers need to have honed consulting skills. And I just mentioned that whenever you want to communicate to the leadership, you need to be able to communicate that in, in good terms. This is this constitutes good consulting skills. Um, they need to be able to help define what is needed versus what is wanted. So a lot of the leadership teams or, or engineers make the mistake of thinking that the leadership knows what they want or knows what is necessary always for the business. That's not true. That's not true. Your manager doesn't always know what needs to be done at the next level. So if you st stick around waiting for that input to trickle down from the top, in my opinion, you're not really being a good senior engineer or a staff engineer. You need to be the person who pushes information upwards and then extracts information downwards. You need to be at this level where you, because especially when you are in tech and you and your the whole business revolves around building a tech product or maybe a tech service, um, uh, leadership cannot make decisions based on what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. They need a lot of information that only a certain level of engineers has in their minds and in the, in the knowledge and you know, whatever they do. So you need to have good consulting skills and you need to come and say, this is what the business needs. And this is why the business needs this, 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 and that. It's very important to have this skill. And it's very important to be able to push back towards your leadership and say, this might be what you want, but this is not necessarily what is needed. And there's a huge distinction in this. And staff engineers understand this very well and they are able to communicate it effectively. 
And finally, the last two things I want to mention are obviously staff engineers, they have more focus on the business outcomes. That's for sure. Uh, they have to be more, again, as I mentioned, more strategic. They need to communicate with leadership. So they have to keep an eye on the business and how it, uh, how it functions. And lastly, inspire others. Staff engineers, they have to be inspiring. I A lot of the engineers, they, they have an authority problem. Uh, we don't like authority. I don't like authority. So whenever someone approaches me with, from, a, from an authoritarian perspective, I don't respond very well. However, there are a lot of people in the field that I respect. And I respect them because at some point, I think that I would like to be like them in a certain way, right? It's, I, I don't like idolizing people, and I'm not trying to say that, but but respect is different than idolizing. Idolizing is putting someone on a pedestal and saying that these are above human or they don't make mistakes and whatnot. That's not what respect is. Respect is basically when you appreciate the skills, you appreciate the humanity, you appreciate the soft skills and the hard skills of a certain individual that you also feel you would like to mimic and uh, implement and have, you know, be part of your profile and be part of your uh, your way of being. And I think a big responsibility for staff level engineers and above is um, they have to inspire. I think they have to, you know, be an inspiration to their teams, their colleagues, to everyone they work with, and they need to be able to uh, communicate that uh, effectively and be able to lead by example. And I think with this, I have covered everything I wanted to say in this session. We have went 16 minutes above the allocated one hour. Uh, I'm sorry about this, but I think there was a lot of content that I wanted to share with you. And I have received a lot of great comments from you and uh, great inputs. And again, thank you very much for everyone who watches these live streams. Your support is amazing. And I'm really happy to always hear your feedback. Please keep it coming. Uh, please subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Uh, like my videos, they will help me grow. And the more I grow, the more I receive your feedback, the more I will be encouraged and inspired, you know, to cover uh, more topics and to have more sessions and to produce more content. Um, all of the content is, is free and I'm not planning to, to think of any way to monetize the channel. And at any point in time that I don't care about that, all I care about is uh, how effective um, this material is for, uh, you know, for you, whichever level you are in your career. Uh, I'm just trying to share uh, what I know best and what I am passionate about. Obviously, I'm not sure if you figured it out, but this domain is something that I really love and I've been doing for probably the longest time uh, <laughs> since, I was, uh, since I was a kid. So I hope this material is effective. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. And I will definitely see you next time. Uh, I'm going to take a break for a couple of weeks because I'm going to be going to Lebanon to visit my family. It's been a while. And I'm going to be back with a lot more awesome material for you and a lot more awesome content. So stay tuned. And until then, I want to wish you all the best.